Kicking off the list at number 10, we have Trial by Blood and Fire. The very first Suicide Squad issue made its first debut back in 1987, and on the cover in big inviting letters says, these eight people will put their lives on the line for our country. One of them won't be coming home. Ooh wee, wonder who it is. So the two issue story was just the beginning of a very long successful run, starting with a fresh lineup of characters that are super well known, like Deadshot and Captain Boomerang. Now, the first issue has an explosive introduction with the stakes raised so high and so fast, with Air Force One being attacked and so many people injured in the process in just one minute and seven seconds, apparently. So who better to call to take down the nasty group than our new group of heroes? So issue two titled Trial by Fire picks up with Captain Boomerang being Australian, the most Australian, saying things like, Cripes! and other stuff. And we see our team in full force, and it's an action-packed introduction. So if you're looking for a place to start, I mean, the beginning is often a safe bet. And in this case, it's one of the most fun issues to read. There's a link, page 18 for that link. Sick. And before we go on to number nine, if you guys could go ahead down there and click us a little thumbs up, that would be great, because it helps us out a lot here at our secret studio. Top secret, don't tell anyone. Okay, you guys rock. Now back to some bad Suicide Squad missions. Number nine, The Phoenix Gambit. Written by Kim Yale and John Ostrander, who has pretty much written all of these, except for maybe a couple. This four-parter begins with The Suicide Squad, Volume 1, Issue 40. So we start with Batman finding a body on the ground near the harbor in Gotham City. And the victim was Nicholas Varga, who owned the shipping yard. Now the body was found as if it was dropped from a great height, but there's no buildings nearby, right? How mysterious. So Batman thinks he was thrown from a ship, which is one hell of a toss. That plus a squished bullet, this is the work of a metahuman for sure. Definitely for sure. So this detective work soon becomes a mission he works alongside a returned Suicide Squad to prevent an international conflict to take place. It's a lot of fun to see Batman go in and convince these big players to work together. I think that's the best part of this whole story. And of course he does it in his usual Batman ways. Yeah, it's super political and the four-parter keeps you hooked. It's a slow burn, it takes time to get cooking, but the action is really fun and the pages become more and more stressful. It'll truly leave your head spinning. Number eight, the Janus Directive. Suicide Squad issues 27 to 30, known as the Janus Directive story, is a big one. So we find this epic crossover with all the major government operations with superheroes, and I'm talking about Checkmate, Project Adam, the Central Bureau of Intelligence, the Peacemaker Project, the Force of July, and of course our very own Suicide Squad, and they're all going at each other because Amanda Waller decided she wanted to be a rogue operation. Mm -mm -mm. But all the while we have Cobra trying to take down the government and replace Amanda Waller with a doppelganger. And the doppelganger of course doesn't last long and Amanda decides to take its place and went to take down Cobra from the inside. It's crazy, a lot of shit goes down. So every organization thinks that they're after each other thanks to this intel referred to as, you guessed it, the Janus Directive. Number seven, Outlaw. John Henry Martin made his first debut in Manhunter issue 16, but he did in fact join the Suicide Squad in issue 58 of the run from the early 90s. But where exactly did his villain journey start? Well, while John was serving time in prison, because that's how every supervillain starts in comics, this bomb called the Gene Bomb exploded and it gave him super strength and it allowed for him to be protected against attacks as well. He couldn't control his abilities well, but he did have these super abilities. He escaped prison, but he didn't get too far being, you know, unexperienced in his new abilities. So he, alongside other Gene Bomb metahuman victims, were put in Bell Ray prison, but they couldn't find any traces of these powers that he used, so they just had to send him back out to the first prison that he easily broke out of the first time around. And during the transportation to go back to that prison, he broke out near the Florida-Georgia border, and then Bob's room. Number six, Up Against the Wall. Suicide Squad issue 10 titled Up Against the Wall is a big fan favorite. So many fans have pointed out that this issue was the biggest change of pace and stepped it up quite a bit for the Suicide Squad title. So we have this epic story that puts the Dark Knight himself against Amanda Waller. It's the issue where Batman discovers the existence of the Suicide Squad. It's a big deal. And let's just say he was pretty shocked about it. He actually threatens Amanda that he's gonna blow the whistle on the whole operation, but Amanda doesn't exactly react too kindly to that. I mean, you know, as fun as exposing a covert government sounds, she explains back to Batman that if he does this, 
she will use everything in her power to find out who he is. See, because he used his Matches Malone cover, he wasn't wearing gloves when he first investigated Bell Rave Penitentiary. No gloves means fingerprints. Not a bad threat, Waller, not a bad threat. Number five, in control slash out of control. So after the events of the killing joke, Barbara Gordon was of course never the same. See, the Joker had put a bullet in her, causing her to remain in a wheelchair. But Ostringer and Yale went a smart route and made her become Oracle, the expert hacker. And it was fun for readers to find out that Oracle was actually Barbara. It was a nice reintroduction, you know? But most importantly, the Suicide Squad at this point didn't know that yet. They didn't know this big reveal, it was just the readers. So it feels like we're in on something secret, you know? So in Suicide Squad issues 48 and 49, it starts with Barbara reliving the horrible events that night. And it ends with her and Amanda becoming closer. Of course, after Barbara Fala, the thinker, that is. Number four, final round. Suicide Squad issue 22, titled The Final Round, is a single issue that actually ties together a bunch of subplots. Let me explain. So it's got to be in here. It's a very, very juicy one. So after Senator Cray hears about the Suicide Squad, he blackmails Amanda to support his re-election, or else he would start spilling secrets, right? A lot of blackmailing, God. So now she's trying to think of another plan to blackmail him back, you know, get some dirt. But Rick Flagg is already on his way to go over and kill Senator Cray and Derek Tolliver. Uh, Derek's actually the one who told Cray about it in the first place, so he's involved. So Amanda sent out the Suicide Squad to stop Rick Flagg, and well, if you know anything about Rick Flagg, that's not going to be an easy task. Some team members are torn at the idea of having to kill Flagg, and then when Deadshot steps in to intervene, he ends up ultimately changing his mind and going against Amanda's orders and killing Cray, bam, right there, right then. And Deadshot actually barely survived this. He got shot numerous times after. It was a whole thing. Number three, The Thinker. He made his first debut in The Flash issue 12 back in the 40s. And he's been around for quite a while. And while his alias doesn't sound too intimidating, Clifford DeVoe is not one you want to mess around with. We can see him in the trailers for James Gunn's Suicide Squad, and I feel like he'll be around in the movie for quite a while. It seems like he's in a quite a good amount of shots. He began his life as Keystone City's district attorney back in 1913, but his life changed when he joined mob boss Norvac one night when he was intoxicated. Which is one of those decisions you make when you're drunk and you're like, well, I guess I'm just gonna roll with it. He offered his skills, well, his services rather, as a thinker. A preparer of alibis and legal precedents in order to keep bad guys out of jail. So Novak was like, score, we can definitely use you on our team. Let's go, here's a house, enjoy. So Novak was later on tricked by the thinker himself when he shot at a reflection in a steel mirror, which caused the bullet to ricochet and then hit himself. So the thinker wasn't even involved in this case. He had nothing to do with it, really. He got on the Flash's naughty list, but when the thinker developed the thinking cap, it allowed him to project mental force upon his enemies. So he's got the brains and power to take down many foes. He accepted a mission with the Suicide Squad in order to get a full pardon, where he was seemingly taken out by the weasel of all people. But in reality, he survived because he's smarter than that. He's a thinker. He actually went on to become friends with Jay Garrick. And you know what? We love a change of heart. Number two, Apocalypse Now. Okay, this one's a huge four-part storyline spanning from issue 33 to 36. Okay, we pick up with Amanda after she has lost control over the Suicide Squad, right? This is a big time. So a new commander has taken her place and she has to try and figure out a plan to get back into the driver's seat, get back into control. Meanwhile, there's a task force member who returns to Apocalypse, putting the team at jeopardy. And where else to fight a god than, well, off world. That's right, in this amazing issue, we get to see the squad square up against Darkseid on Apocalypse and it's gloriously gory, it's terrifying. Also, bonus points for Amanda Waller versus Granny Goodness, which is just icing on the cake for this whole thing. Apocalypse Now is a fun read. I mean, all these humans stuck dealing with Darkseid, it's a genuinely horrific experience for some of them. This is very out of their ballpark. And we also see a great moment from Dr. Light, Poison Ivy's in the mix and she kicks some ass. Led by Lashina of the Female Furies, the team's adventure to Apocalypse is one you definitely won't forget. And then soon after we have, drum roll, that's right. Number one, The Coils of the Loa. Taking place right after Apocalypse Now, this three-parter epic begins, of course, with issue 37. And it's so great because the main focus is on Amanda Waller now and just how far she's willing to go. So The Coils of the Loa is the storyline, of course, that focuses on the Suicide Squad and how they just returned from off-world. 
Meanwhile, the Loa family was developing drugs that would straight up turn people into zombies, and they publicly outed the Suicide Squad. A lot of drama happening in these three issues. Oh my god. So the squad had to be shut down. I mean, the world knows about them now. It's done. The cat's out of the bag. But Amanda Waller decides she's not done yet and sends out another squad to take out the Loa family once and for all. But it sure doesn't help when three squad members who were promised early release take a run for it after that last job that I just mentioned. So Suicide Squad from 33 to 39, if you need to kill some time, these are your must reads, bam. Kicking off the list at number 10, we have Weasel. He's one of those new additions to the team in the highly anticipated James Gunn soft reboot, but who exactly is the sketchy looking villain? All I know is that James Gunn's brother is doing the physical stuff for him, which is great. He did all the work for Rocket Raccoon and Guardians of the Galaxy. So it's gonna be fun, whatever it is, it's gonna be fun, but who is this guy? Is he powerful? Powerful? Is he evil? What's his deal? Well, he made his first debut back in Firestorm Volume 2, Issue 36. He made his mark at Stanford University working alongside Professor Martin Stein. Even before this happened, he wasn't liked by other students. He was deemed an unremarkable and unlikable man, and sadly was given the nickname Weasel. He wasn't a fan of this, obviously, it made him pretty insecure. So when he got hired as a teacher at Candermere University, he was easily fed up with the other faculty members as it was just those mean students grown up. So, of course. So he viewed them as a threat, obviously, and he dressed up like this Weasel character and started taking them out. He started attacking them one by one. Now, as far as Suicide Squad members go, this is one of the weaker ones pulled out of Bell Rave Penitentiary. But he is gonna be in the new film, so we gotta talk about him at least a little bit. He didn't last long in the comics either. His last issue was Doom Patrol and Suicide Squad Special Issue 1, where during a mission to rescue Hawk, Weasel took out the Thinker, who I'll mention later on in this list. And then when Rick Flagg put on the Thinker's helmet, the Thinker's last thought took over and Rick ended up being the one to take the Weasel out. I'm pretty sure this is gonna happen in the movie, but if not, we're still happy. He appeared later on in the comics as well, but this was during the Blackest Night storyline when he was revived as a Black Lantern. And before we continue on with this list of Suicide Squad members, guys, if you wanna go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, that would be great. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for your support. We're gonna get right back into the video. Let's go. Number nine, Bane. It's kind of hard to forget a villain like Bane. He's a big fan of, you know, breaking backs. And when you break the back of somebody like Batman, you're gonna have to be locked up away for probably a little while. Bane is a super smart villain and the steroid called Venom that's being pumped into his veins sure does help get the attention of the Suicide Squad. I mean, once you break the bat, that's a pretty good audition, I'd say. At the end of the series, Suicide Squad raised the flag. Amanda Waller recruited Bane to the Suicide Squad and we once again see Bane rocking the camel back of strength. He's got his Venom again, this time in Outsiders issue 50. The team makes their grand entrance and Bane right off the bat doesn't like following the instructions of leader Rick Flagg. Flagg says to just simply use the stun gun and Bane's like, nope, gonna do it my way. Thank you, sir. So it's no surprise when the team tricks Bane in Salvation Run issue two. See, they're assigned to ship villains to salvation by using boom tubes and Bane and Deadshot ended up being sent as well. Yeah, get that psycho out of here. Go, go break some other backs or don't break backs. How about that? Go back into jail. Number eight, Killer Croc. A face we saw in David Ayer's Suicide Squad, a face that's rather terrifying and a face you wouldn't really forget. Killer Croc, AKA Waylon Jones, made his first appearance in Detective Comics issue 523. He was born in Florida and faced a medical condition that, well, look at him, it turned him into a crocodile. When he was an adult, he began wrestling alligators at carnivals just to make ends meet, hence the name Killer Croc. That was his stage name at first. But realizing crime was suited best for Wayland, he left the carnival and became one of Gotham's most feared criminals. He wasn't a member until the recent 2016 run of Suicide Squad. And he's like, okay, anything but space. I'll do the missions as long as it's not in space. First mission they go to, Space. Number seven, El Diablo. This was a key member in the climax of David Ayer's Suicide Squad, Cheto Santana. He joined the team in 2011 with the new 52's version of the Suicide Squad. And his powers, well, yeah, you probably guessed it. Similar to that fire guy I was just talking about. He has the powers of pyrokinesis, and when he uses up all of his power, like we saw on the big screen, he can become much larger. He grows wings too. He straight up becomes a fire demon. How scary is that? Now he's got quite the temper. Back before his Suicide Squad days were even upon him, he burned down an entire building just to settle a score with a gang. But then when he realized that innocent people were involved, obviously he turned himself in. So he's trying, you know? Number six, Adam Smasher. He's the grandson of the supervillain Cyclotron, so you already know he's gonna be a hard time. Meet Albert Rothstein. He made his comic book debut at All-Star Squadron issue 25, and his powers were passed down. 
those powers being pretty spectacular. He can control the size of his body. He can change his molecular structure, and he was also the godson of the Golden Age version of the Atom, Al Pratt. In 52, issue 24, Amanda Waller recruits Adam Smasher to go against Black Adam. He actually recruits the squad himself, where he brings on Count Vertigo, Electrocutioner, Persuader, Plastique, and Captain Boomerang 2. Number five, Captain Boomerang. Okay, so I mentioned Captain Boomerang 2, but we gotta talk about the original, the OG Captain Boomerang. We saw him in the first Suicide Squad movie played by Jai Courtney, and he made his first appearance back in The Flash, issue 117. George Harkness was originally a Flash villain, and if you can take on the fastest man alive, eh, you've got a pretty good resume. So far, so good. His skill set shouldn't shock you given his name, Captain Boomerang. He was the son of an American toy maker, and he created these special boomerangs that helped him get into trouble. Alongside his pal, Mick Wentworth. Nothing more intimidating than a guy with boomerangs, okay? So of course, Amanda Waller had to recruit this wacky villain. In exchange for a pardon and a prison release, of course, he was sent in to attack Britain stone at Mount Rushmore. I'm excited to see James Gunn's version of Captain Boomerang. He's said to be more or so the same as his version from the last one, but we'll see. He might have a little flashier outfit. I'm okay with that. Number four, Kimo. He made his first debut at Showcase issue 39 in a story called The Deathless Doom. Now, the scientist kept failing one experiment after another, but he kept working. He was dedicated to the cause. For science, people, science. So Kimo was not the name of a scientist. No, the scientist's name was Ramsey Norton. Kimo would be an awful name for a scientist. Kimo was the name he had given this plastic vessel to store all these chemicals after the experiments had failed. Big old vat of yuck. So when he finally added some failed growth formula to the mix, this vat came to life. This toxic creation who kept the name Kimo, of course. He ended up taking out the poor scientist that had created him, which is right off the bat, truly evil stuff. I feel bad for Kimo though, I'll be honest, because he didn't find out he wasn't a living thing until Supergirl told him in Supergirl Volume 4, Issue 5. She told him he's just a collection of chemicals and he was so upset he dispersed himself in the atmosphere and then it rained. In Adventures of Superman, he did join the Suicide Squad briefly in Issue 593. He worked alongside Manchester Black, Plasmus, and Shrapnel and their plan was to take out Superman. Number three, Punch and Jewelie. A two for one combo coming right at you, okay. So this criminal duo made their first appearance in Secret Origins Volume 2, Issue 28 and they're not taken seriously by most, but they've been known to be just as unpredictable as the Joker and Harley Quinn. See, Julie grew up in Brooklyn with Punch and they worked as puppeteers at Coney Island during the day, which sounds like a blast. But at nighttime, the couple drifts into the shadows and they become thieves. They came across a container filled with alien weaponry and they used it to create this underground base in Coney Island. And their criminal super career was born. They were recruited by the Suicide Squad in issue 24 of Ostrander's run in the 80s, but they left when a pregnancy came into the picture. Probably a good time to quit a Suicide Squad. I'd agree on that departure for sure. Number two, Peacemaker. John Cena himself is making his debut as Peacemaker in James Gunn's Suicide Squad, but he's also getting his own spin-off series. How exciting is this? When he was first asked about the role during DC fandom, Cena himself compared the character to a terrible cocky Captain America, which sounds about right. So Christopher Smith showed up early in comics with the Fightin' Five issue 40. That was when he was with Charlton Comics. He was part of a paramilitary force that kept the world safe. I mean, he didn't even carry weapons that could cause bodily harm. That's how much he meant well. But then after Crisis on Infinite Earths, he entered DC Comics with the same name, only now he has no problem taking out bad guys, all while spreading peace and love. So the guy's a maniac, basically. To be honest, I could probably watch this guy for an entire season of a show. Definitely, John Cena is great. He's so funny and he's also so ripped and humongous and terrifying. So it's gonna be a good time. And finally, number one. Killer Frost. Louise Lincoln, AKA Killer Frost. She's actually the second Killer Frost in the comics, but she made her debut with Firestorm Volume 2, Issue 21. She was actually a friend and co-worker of the previous Killer Frost, but after that Frost had passed away, somebody had to step up, right? So she repeated the same experiment and voila, we have a new and improved Killer Frost. She immediately went after Firestorm because, you know, they were to blame for the death of the previous Frost, which is always great when we have a villain do a nice grudgy start like that. She ended up selling her soul to Neron for more power. So it's safe to say you want to keep your distance with this one. She joined the Suicide Squad briefly in the comics and she was also a key member in the animated Suicide Squad film, Hell to Pay. Kicking off the list at number 10, Slipknot. Yeah, so he was in David Ayer's Suicide Squad, but he didn't last long. I think he was in the movie for 46 seconds, maybe longer. 
felt like 46. He got robbed. He's actually really cool in the comics. He's a mercenary who can climb anything. He uses his trusty ropes and grappling hooks, and being a formidable assassin, he should have probably survived longer in that movie. He joined the team in Fury of Firestorm versus the Suicide Squad. In the comics, he and Captain Boomerang believed that the bombs Waller had strapped to their arms were fake just like in the movie. So Slipknot tried to make a run for it, and in doing so, he got his arm blown to smithereens. And at that point, Captain Boomerang was like, mm, okay, maybe they're real, maybe they're real. Okay, I believe you. And before we continue on with this list of powerful Suicide Squad members, guys, if you wanna go ahead and hit that thumbs up, because it really does help us out quite a bit here at our studio. You guys are the best, thank you so much. Now let's get right back to the list. Number nine. Tatsu Yamashiro was a member of David Ayer's Suicide Squad, and she made her comic book debut in The Brave and the Bold, issue 200. She's a skilled martial artist who wields the Soul Taker sword, which sounds as cool as it is. Her husband's soul is actually one of the many that are trapped inside said sword. She trained as a samurai under Master Tadishi, and then she suited up and headed to America to join the fight for justice. She joined the Suicide Squad in Volume 5, issue 27. Other than being a powerful member of the squad, she's also been a key member of The Outsiders. Number eight. Eight, blockbuster. This absolute unit entered Detective Comics in 1965, issue 345. Mark Desmond was kind of a Bruce Banner situation. Kind of. He was a brilliant scientist who felt like he was too scrawny. Yeah, he wanted to become stronger. He wanted to be bigger. He wanted to get ripped and Sarah's discovery wasn't cutting it. So what did he do? He created a serum that just made him strong because that's what you do in comics. He got super strength, but unfortunately the serum side effects resulted in him being a mindless brute and he no longer was capable of talking as well. He was part of the Suicide Squad in the comics, but again, not for long. One of those characters that was cut too short. In Legends issue three, Task Force X is sent to Mount Rushmore to take out Brimstone, but Brimstone actually used his fire powers against Blockbuster and Muscles versus Fire. Usually fire is gonna win that battle. Muscles versus Fire, Fire is probably gonna win nine times out of 10, 10 times out of 10, definitely. So that was Blockbuster's last appearance, short and sweet. Number seven, Deadshot Bulletproof. This time we have a story coming to us, not by Ostrander, but by Christos and Gage. So we get an up close and personal look at a fan favorite member, Deadshot, who most of us know now as Will Smith and soon we'll know him as Idris Elba. Gotta love DC and their DC-ness. So we find Floyd Lawton, and he has a bit more depth to him this time around in the 2005 five-parter, specifically in the form of a daughter. That's right, he finds out that she's currently residing in a violent neighborhood, so he goes in to clean up a bit. And if that means taking out some gang members, then eh, so be it. Family is family. Number six. Black Manta. David Hyde, most would recognize as a major Aquaman villain, AKA Black Manta. The most recent incarnation of the villain was introduced in Aquaman Volume 7, Issue 7. He grew up on a houseboat, excelling in diving and treasure hunting, and his parents were divorced and he stuck with his father, Jesse Hyde. Cause yeah, treasure hunting beats pretty much whatever's going on on mom's side. Sorry. They were looking for the Black Pearl, which wasn't a ship with Johnny Depp drunk aboard, Rather, it was a pearl that granted its users hydrokinetic abilities. And in Teen Titans Volume 6, Issue 10, David found that pearl. He later joined the squad in Volume 4 when he thought Aquaman had perished, because he figured, well, nothing better to do. Might as well just join this team and do some, some villain stuff. Number five, Mind Boggler. First appearing in Firestorm Volume 2, Issue 29, Leia Wasserman is a punk rocker who just happens to have been given powers by Breathtaker of the Assassination Bureau. Those powers being mind control, and she's actually really, really good at it. Her name is Mind Boggler, so she must be, right? She can make the walls seem like they're closing in, resulting in her victim to suffer a loss of equilibrium that they just instantly feel nauseous. Hey, it's Mind Boggler. Yeah. <laughs> One sec. She was on the Suicide Squad, but Captain Boomerang let her get riddled with bullets. You know, because she humiliated him for harassing another member. So yeah, Captain Boomerang's kind of the worst. Number four, Mr. 104. Not to be confused with Mr. 305, although they are very similar. We now go to Doom Patrol and Suicide Squad special. He's originally a Doom Patrol villain, but they all teamed up to rescue Hawk in Nicaragua. So I had to include this guy because, well, he would be much different now if he came around in the comics or the movies. Mr. 104 can transform his body into any of the elements. See, back then there were only 104. Now this dude could have transformed into 118 or whatever the number is. Unfortunately, his time as a Suicide Squad member was cut short while they were fighting the Rocket Red Brigade. Number three, Bad Blood. 
Written by Tom Taylor and Bruno Redondo, we get a promising front cover saying, by the end of this issue, half of the team will be dead. But why? What is this, Infinity War? Someone gonna snap their fingers? Well, the squad gets assigned a new mission to take down some super terrorists called the Revolutionaries. But here's the twist that made this issue stand out. The surviving Revolutionary members are joining the Suicide Squad. So what a weird thing. It's like, hey, fight him, but whoever wins is gonna join you. So you're like, mm, okay. So Harley Quinn and Deadshot basically have to figure out who to trust when they were assigned to also kill them at the same time. It's a fun concept and a pretty exciting introduction to some new faces. Number two, Captain Cold. Leonard Snart made his debut in Showcase issue eight. Now, Leonard enjoyed the company of his grandfather who ran an ice cream truck, but after he passed away, Leonard had to just spend his remaining days with his father, who was just a terrible parent all around. So this led to Leonard joining a group of thieves but he was caught by the Flash. See, originally he was a Flash villain. So next he studied the energy emissions of a cyclotron and figured, hmm, maybe it could work against this Flash guy. So he designed a weapon that could freeze people using the moisture in the air, Frozone style. And then he later on joined the squad in issue 17. I would be pretty pumped to see Captain Cold in live action. I feel like we need an evil Frozone on the big screen, that's for sure. And finally coming in at number one, Poison Ivy. Pamela Isley, there we go. She joined the team in issue 33. She actually stuck around for quite a while. She made her comic book debut way back earlier in Batman issue 181. She studied botany in Seattle, and after she was poisoned from special herbs, she got these fantastic abilities, and now she's invulnerable to all these poisons, and after spending some time in prison, after run-ins with the bat, she was recruited to the Suicide Squad. Like I said, she stuck around for quite a while. She helped the team out from issues 33 to 66. Now around the same time, she was also spreading deadly toxins around Gotham City in hopes that the only remaining citizens would be those naturally immune. So yeah, she's kind of a big bad deal. Well,